Thanks so much everyone for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers. We've got an awesome panel here. Amazing group of functional doctors, technology, activists uh, for here for Elite Board in Medicine. You know, our goal is to make it easy for practitioners to learn in community. This ecosystem that is being set up by the meetup groups, we believe will be the future ecosystem of this evolved primary care network, and it all revolves around you. Welcome to the Functional Forum. Thanks for joining us in the charge to accelerate the evolution of medicine. Please welcome your host, James Masco. Hello and welcome to the Functional Forum. We are super excited to bring you another Functional Forum on the topic of stress and the brain. And this month we are gonna go deeper into understanding interconnections that connect stress, the brain, and biological rhythms. It's gonna be a great show, enjoy. So one of the myth busters here at PLMI has been Dr. Tom Williams. And for those of you who have heard him lecture before, you know he is a fountain of knowledge when it comes to science and the interpretation of science into clinical practice. He gave a great talk earlier. Here are some of the highlights. If I go back to the basics and I look at lifestyle medicine, which is really what this is about, how do you apply lifestyle medicine, I think of understanding how life signals are interpreted by our bodies and converting them into health. So I always think of what is the mechanism for how life signals uh, work in the body. Um, but understanding the mechanism doesn't always help the patient, so you have to implement these signals in a form of actionable events and behaviors in which to engage or avoid. So you know we can talk about, and we will talk about, clock and BMOL and NRF2 and all these other signals that many of you are familiar with, but you can't go into a patient and say, you know, Mrs. Smith, you know, you need to get your BMOL a little better or your NRF2 activation or something. So you have to start talking about, we, we have to talk about diet, lifestyle, really things that we uh, can actually do as an actionable uh, I, uh, event. So measuring the impacts of these signal changes on meaningful outcomes. So this is where the clinician needs to say, you know, you've, been, you've changed your diet for six months and now I can see something demonstrably different in you and, and we can know whether that change was good or whether that change was bad. Um, and then we need to modify. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, lifestyle medicine is constantly modifying um, and to reach those targets. And so if I were to put my definition of what I consider personalized lifestyle medicine, it would be this. Helping a patient discover and prioritize those lifestyle changes that will have the greatest impact on their health while empowering them to implement those changes, allowing them to reach their life's purpose. So understanding what those decisions, what those changes need to be, and prioritizing them, because as you well know, um, you could come up with a laundry list of things that are 10 or 15 things they need to change, and that can be overwhelming. So helping them prioritize those that are gonna be the most impactful and then empowering them to make those changes for themselves uh, so they can really do what it is they, they're calling in life, uh, ultimately. So a lot of you have seen this picture I've used before. It's sort of like what is in the black box, or in this case, the uh, orange circle that, that takes this genetics, this lifestyle environment, and creates what we call health and disease. So that's really, uh, kind of what I've been trying to figure out and trying to help people understand uh, the mechanisms behind that. And those signals that I, I call these signals, uh, signals of life come from everything. So no matter what you want to interpret, whether it's part of your diet, whether it's part of your activity, whether it's uh, the emotions that you have when you interact with individuals, all of those turn into some biochemical signal and we now know epigenetic signals that not only affect the moment, but they could affect, you know, for the rest of your life or at least part of the rest of your life. Um, and we know like early life stressors as infants in uh, metabolism really for the rest of that individual's life. So these are, the, these are just some of the signals that I consider part of that scheme. And in the book that you guys have, the original prescription, I broke them down into these seven different areas and we're not going to go through all of them, but the idea is we could easily jumble up these into 10 categories. We could put these into three. I mean, it really de depends on how you want to categorize them, but you can see that I, I put them in sort of these different groupings, but they're not all interdependent. Uh, excuse me, they, there's a lot of interdependence between, there's, they're not independent. 
So today I'm going to talk about one of the groupings that I use. I use the word chronicity when I wrote this back in 2012 because circadian rhythm is one of the biological rhythms. But as we know that there are monthly cycles, there's even a, a circuseptin cycle, a seven-day cycle in some cases. And certainly there's an annual cycle and a lifetime cycle. So uh, chronicity is what I called it back then um, because of chronobiology. Um, I'm going to talk about the stress response and the interaction between the stress response and the circadian and other rhythms in the talk today. But I'm, and I'm also going to be talking later in my second talk about diet and nutrients and how those interface uh, together with the stress response and circadian rhythm because there's a relationship between them. But we already know that there is a major environmental influence on this, which we all know is sunlight, is, is probably one of the, the greatest triggers of that. But we also know that the gut microflora, which I consider sort of an external environment, even though we house it in our gut, it's sort of external to the human. And it also acts as a signal uh, that we're going to talk about. And then finally, even physical activity, um, we know is a trigger for uh, circadian control. So many of the things that I had put in these categories are obviously influence, influence one another and create sort of a, uh, a, a set of signals that then retrain the metabolism more likely either for health or if they're off uh, for some sort of chronic uh, deficiency. So we have two major signals. We have on the right hand side you can see the surveillance of stress so the hypothalamus is essentially a stress surveillance uh, system. It's taking all the information from outside the body, what are the threats around me, and what are all the potential threats within. And my, chain, my blood pressure, my heart rate, my uh, body temperature, my nutrition status, all of that piece of information are gonna assess, the brain needs to assess on a moment by moment basis, along with everything around me, um, you know, what, is, what, are my th what are my stress or my threat levels? And I'm gonna talk briefly about this, but these are sort of four key areas, the perception of stress, circadian disruption, glycemic dysregulation, and infl inflammation or inflammatory signals. These are the big categories that trigger the HPA axis when it comes to the stress response. And that's being consolidated by the paraventricular nucleus in the hypothalamus. And the other factor is the circadian resynchronization that comes from the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Those two pieces of information, I mean, there's more than, they're not two, but they're consolidated pieces of information, begin the production of CRH, okay? So we have, CRH is produced by the paraventricular nucleus, and it goes into uh, the pituitary, and we get the, then the triggering of ACTH. And eventually, most of you know, ACTH then pr produces cortisol, and then we get the classic feedback inhibition. So we're not going to go through that. Hopefully most of you are familiar with that kind of, if we call it the central dogma of the, uh, of the HPA axis. What ma many people don't know is that there's a direct innervation between the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the adrenal gland, as well as other organ systems as well. And that actually affects the sensitivity of the adrenal cortex to ACTH. Okay? So you'll see that there's not only is, th is that being signaled by the production of CRH and ACTH, but also the sensitivity of ACTH in the adrenal gland is being directly affected by the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And I'll, we'll be talking a little bit more about why that is. But that has a lot to do with why you see a raise, rising ACTH in the early morning before you arise, but you typically don't see the cortisol awakening response until you wake up. And that's partly due to the fact that when you wake up, there is a trigger that happens in the suprachiasmatic nucleus that while you have the gas of the ACTH going on already, you have a break. And the break is being put on by the suprachiasmatic nucleus to reduce the, the sensitivity of ACTH or, or the, the reduce, yeah, reduce the sensitivity to ACTH. And as soon as you wake up, it lets off the break and you get an immediate rise in cortisol, which then is intended to allow you to wake up and face the day and face the dangers of the day and all those sorts of things as well. So if you look at the circadian and ultradian rhythms of ACTH and cortisol, it would look like this. So if you actually look at this is, this is now total cortisol. This, is, this would be the total, not the free cortisol. 
you'll see that this is not a, a delicate curve that you typically would get when you only sample four or five times a day. So you have an ultra dian rhythm. Well, it's ultra dian. That means pulsatile throughout the day. You have these multiple pulses of ACTH, which create a somewhat of a pulsatile effect on cortisol, which of course is lowest when you're sleeping, which is the black bar here. This is humans. Um, and rises early in the morning, as you'd see. Now, most of you are looking at free cortisol, so you typically would see a very a curve like this that would go up in the morning, uh, which we call the cortisol awakening response, but it, the cortisol curve isn't that clean. If you were to measure it 100 times a day versus five times a day or six times a day, you'd get a really different curve. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit later, but this pulsatility actually is very important when it comes to distinguishing between a stress response and a circadian response. As we're gonna see in my discussion, if, if the stress response is actually important for regulating circadian rhythm, you could imagine one stressful response could throw you off loop for you know, days perhaps. And thankfully that doesn't happen um, just with one stressful response uh, because, of, because of these ultra dian rhythms that are working behind the system. So as it turns out, there's other factors that, that create a jagged sort of like this into something a little more smooth, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But remember, there's cortisol binding globulin, there's albumin that bind 95% the, the of cortisol, which prevents it from just going out at haywire all, all day long. What were some things that you learned that you can take back to your practice and your colleagues? It's not what you eat, it's when you eat. That'll wow my private practice. I'm a family doc with a private practice. I'm also a hospice doc. So I see the end, and when you see the end, and it doesn't have to be the end, this is why you learn here. American health insurance is broken. We spend too much, but we get too little. We can feel this even more when we're already committed to a healthy lifestyle. What we really need is ownership over our own personal health and wellness and peace of mind when the unexpected happens. That's what New Health offers. Empowerment to own your health your way. We provide resources to help you actually stay well. We're talking sustainable options for body, mind, and spirit. Most importantly, you'll save money every month to fund the wellness activities that you value. Then, in the event of unexpected illness or injury, the community is there to help you pay for the care you need. All of this at a much lower monthly cost than regular insurance. Take control of what you can, and together we'll share in the things you can't. Start exploring now and see how much you could save. All right, what a thrill for the Functional Forum to have one of the lead researchers from one of the seminal studies in this field. We're here with Dr. Fred Turek. He has been a researcher for decades, working at Northwestern since 1975, and one of the lead, the lead researcher on the NASA twin study that is spoken about a lot in our space. So it's an absolute thrill to have you here, Doc, and to, to share a little bit, and really enjoyed your, uh, your talk today. So uh, in that twins, study that is oft quoted by Jeff Bland and, and many others. What was what were some things that came out of that that was sort of revelatory to you at the time? Well, the thing w about the twin study is, first off, I'm only one of 10 leads. I wasn't the lead. I was the one of 10, 10 leads. They brought together 10 different groups of people who were studying different aspects of human physiology. So some people were studying the genome, sequencing the genomes of the two, of the two twins. Uh, some were looking at gene expression. Some were looking at the immune response. Some were looking at telomere length, which are the ends of the chromosomes. And we were looking at the microbiota, the gut microbiota. Absolutely. One of the phrases that you used in your, in your talk, which I was uh, interested to hear, was clock shock. Can you explain? Is that a term that you came up with, or is that me? Well, let me, let me explain that we've been studying circadian rhythms in sleep for like 40 some years now and I happened to get involved with gastro gastroenterologist uh, Ali Kassel-Vazer at Rush uh, about a decade ago and we started looking at circadian rhythms in the, in the gut and just the functioning of the gut, the gastrointestinal tract. And we noticed when we disrupted rhythms or sleep, we altered gut function. We altered the leakiness of the gut. Uh, which causes endotoxins to be released, and that's what causes liver damage, brain damage. And then we said, well, is there any change in the microbiota? 
And so in 2014, we published a paper showing that changes in the circadian clock could alter the microbiota, and that led to the twin study. But my interest was in sleep and circadian clocks for a much longer period of time, and where the clock shock comes in, when I first started off, we, we knew where the circadian clock was located in the, in the brain. It was located in an area of the hypothalamus, anterior hypothalamus, and that was the master clock regulating all the rhythms of the body, whether it's body temperature, cortisol rhythm, uh, enzymatic rhythms, all the hormonal rhythms. The clock shock was when we discovered the first circadian clock genes and cloned the genes in, in fruit flies first and then in, and then in mammals, that these genes were in all the cells of the body. That's the clock shock. The shock was, we thought it was just in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and then we found the genes in all the cells of the body, and then these genes are regulating the expression of what we call clock control genes. So in any one tissue, 30 to 50% of the genes that are expressed in your heart or your liver go up at one time of day, down at another time of day. Same with the intestine, same with the liver, same with the muscles, same with different areas of the brain. So the clock shock was that the, that the, the genes were all over. That was the whole body, every cell of the body, I would essentially say. And that, that changed the whole field. It meant, well, what happens if this organ The heart is out of synchrony with the pancreas. What if it's out of synchrony with the brain? What if we live a lifestyle where the clock controls the feeding rhythm and the feeding rhythm has an impact on lots of tissues like the liver, but now we eat at different times of the day or the wrong times of day or we sleep at the wrong times of day. Now we've got a clock in the brain that's entrained to the 24-hour solar cycle. And now, because... We are not listening to our clock. We're the only species, by the way, that does not, as I say, we don't obey our biological clock. We can just override it. As I said, my, my mice never go to the movie at night. They never stay up night. They don't drink at night. And so they're, they're, all their tissues of the body are in synchrony with each other unless we do experiments to, to only feed them at one time of day or sleep deprive them. But in humans, we just do that on a routine basis in large part because we now can do it, meaning that over the last 120 years, electricity has overtaken our life. Before that, before Edison, we really didn't have an opportunity to be active at night in any sorts of large numbers. Yeah, super interesting. You know, one of the things I want to come back to that you said there was just the way that sleep can affect leaky gut. Now, as a researcher, that I'm, and I'm sure you've been spending some time with Jeff Bland over the years to, to get into that. When you discover these kind of things, how quickly did these ideas permeate through other researchers in, in sort of adjunctive fields? Well, let me, let me say that, give you an example. In, we published in, in 2009, that's a decade ago, that if we fed our are mice at the wrong time of day, meaning the time of day they normally don't eat. Yeah. Mice are nocturnal, they eat about 80% of their food at night, 20% during the day. We did a simple study, 80%, uh, 100%, they could only eat during the wrong time of day, the light phase for them, or they could only eat during the dark phase. And the ones we get, the, the right time of day. The ones we gave the food during the wrong time of day, they gained more weight, even though they ate the same amount of food, had the same amount of activity. So taking in food at the wrong circadian time led to weight increase. Now, within 10 years, there have probably been, well, I know there's been uh, uh, probably 50 epidemiological studies, and now there's a lot of clinical studies showing this is true in humans as well. So it translates quite fast into the scientific community. The hard part is even though we know where the clock genes are, we know that when they're, when they're disrupted, they interfere with a lot of cellular systems. We know those cellular systems can affect the brain, neurological disorders. It can affect uh, the, the pancreas, diabetes. Now we've got that information, and the third step is taking it to the clinic clinical care, the hundreds of thousands of doctors who are treating the patients, that's the block. It takes a long time to convince physicians to change the way they do what they learn to do in medical school. 
Well, you're speaking to now, you know, a group of physicians that have decided that they want to be up with the times, right? That they want to, you know, start to take in new literature and not wait 17 years or 50 years to do it. So I hope that, um, you know, they're taking this on, on board right now. You know, one of the things that was super interesting is obviously you spending time looking at the microbiome, but I think there were some implications um, you know, for psychiatry, for, for the work that you're doing. Do you want to just talk to that a little? Yeah, with psychiatry, early on, that's why I had that paper, which was called uh, Depression, Colon, A Disorder of Circadian Timekeeping with Dr. Van Carter at the University of Chicago. And what, we, what had been noticed was that people who were depressed, often I had their, their, their clock was delayed or advanced, and so they were not um, synchronized to, the, to, their, to their cycle, to the normal 24-hour day. So that was, that's why it showed a cartoon. But over the last, I'd say, 20 years or so, we began to link uh, abnormal rhythms, abnormal sleep with depression. The, the first real handle came when discovery of seasonal affective disorder. This is a disorder that occurs in a large number of people. They get depressed in the winter. And, and that's been shown that that's related to the length of the day. So here we had a, a type of depression, and remember one of the problems with the word depression is that it could cover a lot of illnesses. In other words, a lot of causes could be causing the depression. It's a wastebasket diagnosis, yes. right? I, I like that. I use the analogy of uh, fever. 150 years ago, if you had a fever, you had a fever. Now we know that there are many, many things that can cause a fever. You have depression. There are many things that will cause depression. And we are interested in whether or not, if you have a disruption of circadian rhythms, imagine if in your different areas of your brain that are involved in cognition and, and anxiety, if their rhythms are not in synchrony with each other, you sort of got you know, a, a, a Picasso uh, brain, meaning it just doesn't look real, doesn't look right. And... Um, so we, we and others have been looking for how effects of sleep and changes in rhythm could affect depression. And let me just, I didn't get to that part of the, in the talk today. A few years ago, I wrote a paper called, if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, eats like a duck, it's a duck. And what it was, was sleep loss, insomnia occurs often before depression. The treatment of depression with, say, Prozac and with a hypnotic has better consequences than the treatment with just the Prozac. And then when these people get better, their depressive symptoms decrease, their sleep becomes better. So, and everybody said, oh, you're, you're, you're not sleeping well because you're depressed. The, the duck story meant, no, it's causing depression. Now, do I really think that it's the only cause of depression? No. But if you're not sleeping, if you're, if you're bipolar or you're sensitive to depression, you have cycles of depression, and then you go through a period of bad sleep, that could just be putting you on the trajectory to turn you into depression. There's been so much focus in our community on sort of nutritional approaches to depression and, and those kind of things. This seems just such a, you know, low hanging fruit, right? To be able to help people sleep and can avoid that or even, you know, get them on in moving towards a virtuous cycle. Yeah, and I think that's true in a lot of areas. So for example, with diabetes, uh, the latest, uh, uh, recommendations from the American Diabetes Association, you know, they come up with the guidelines about what, what your diet should be, what your exercise should be, and of course, it's, it's many forms of, of, of mild diabetes, you don't even need to take drugs, you could just change your lifestyle by changing your eating habits, your exercise. Sleep. Where is sleep in there? We really haven't hit that community. Uh, as Dr. Van Carter said to me, boy, we've really demonstrated that short sleep results in people having insulin resistance, which is the first sign. And boy, we've really shown everybody. And it was a conference call, and she says, no, we haven't. You're talking to the seven or eight people in the, in, well, not the world, but seven or eight people in the United States who, who really understand, but we really haven't reached out to the 30,000 physicians who are treating diabetic patients.
Yeah, well, look, we hope here at the Evolution of Medicine to be a catalyst to try and get this out to more people, not just the doctors doing it, but we have doctors who are employing health coaches who can do it at a fraction of the cost. It doesn't really need a doctor to sort of help someone to sleep. And, and ultimately, we hope to be building structures to be able to deliver this in a, in a sort of a affordable and scalable way to the masses. Obviously, it is slow going when you're dealing with uh, the translation of clinical uh, and new clinical information into practice and new research. But uh, thank you for all the, the work is an amazing talk today thank you very much thanks doc take care all right we are here in the practice implementation showroom here at the plmi conference and if you don't know our latest sponsor here at the forum is the lifestyle matrix resource center let's go and take a look obviously there's a lot of people checking it out because it's awesome so you know one of the things you'll see and why we're super excited about it is there's a lot of patient education that is not being done very efficiently because it's been done face to face people don't remember what you say so you need things like this, like this is from the Cardio Metabolic, uh, one which is Dr. Shilpa Saxena's. How many times have you had to uh, uh, communicate how inflammation plays a role in cardiometabolic disease? A lot, right? So how do you help patients to remember that and communicate that to their spouse or their family members or their other doctor? You have a really easy tool like this atherosclerosis, a chronic inflammatory condition. So these kind of tools are super valuable to be able to back up what you're telling patients in a really easy way. So that's one of the things, there's five different issues. You've got stress, there's um, HPA axis, there's uh, cardiometabolic, there's gut. Let's also check out over here. This is the reason why I initially loved uh, the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center was because of the group visits, right? We're gonna be hot on group visits, uh, for, you know, for the foreseeable future. But these tools, the group visit toolkits, make it super easy for you to run your first group visit. Patients love it, doctors love it. It is the way that functional integrated medicine is gonna make it to the masses. So these group visit toolkits make it super easy to run the group visits, optimize presence and influence, increase revenue in less time, inspire hope and empowerment. That's what we're all about. So go to goevomed.com slash GVT, group visit toolkit, goevomed.com slash GVT to find out more about that, and goevomed.com slash LMRC to find out more about the Lifestyle Matrix Resource Center. Check it out. So our next speaker is Dr. Helen Messier. She is not only a functional medicine doctor, but a leader in understanding the genetics of the microbiome and of the human body. And she gave a great talk on the microbiome and how it relates to circadian rhythms. Super fascinating information, great speaker. Let's check out some of the best bits. Now, of course, it's obvious that diet and the timing of eating are important to the microbiome and to us their host. But let's look at a couple studies that look in the context of this in, in the context of circadian rhythms. This study showed that weekly phase reversals of light-dark cycles, not, so not as severe as these continuous light-dark cycles, change, those changes didn't alter the microbiome in mice-fed standard chow, but mice fed a high fat, high sugar diet in conjunction with these phase shifts had significantly altered microbiota. So circadian disruption can worsen the effects of a poor diet. And when the mice were fed a high fat diet and then allowed to eat ad lib, their daily feeding fasting rhythms changed. Their microbial cyclical fluctuations changed and they became obese. And when these high fat diet mice, as we heard a little bit about um, this morning, were only allowed to eat in the dark phase, right? So now we're talking about that time restricted feeding the microbiome rhythms were starting, they, became, they re were restored, at least partially. So time-restricted feeding, it protected against obesity and metabolic disease in the host, and as it's not surprising by now, it affected bacteria to shown to influence host metabolism. So we have to think about this intermittent fasting, right, and not raiding that fridge late at night. This is a nice summary of what I've gone over and some of the research shows about the oscillations um, of the microbiome. On the left, you can see the changes in composition of some of the organisms. The ones in black are those that peak during um, 
the day and those in blue are the ones that peak during the night and you can see it also changes the functions so the function of the microbiome changes so environmental sensing detoxification chemotaxis were higher during periods of fasting and energy metabolism cell growth dna repair protein production was much more prevalent during um, times of activity when there's a lot of nutrient availability. And then the microbial metabolites also fluctuate during the day. And this summarizes what happens when we lose that diurnal rhythmicity. It results in dysbiosis, and that in turn results in metabolic disease. But as I said, it really is a chicken and egg sort of thing, where the host influences the microbiome, and the microbiome influences the host. So let's look at the other side of that chicken and egg and explore how the gut microbiome influences our circadian clock. And it does this by producing a lot of metabolites. Now in this study, in rats, the rats were treated with antibiotics to disrupt their microbiome, and it showed a significant reduction in slow-wave sleep and an increase in sleep latency. So we need our microbiome in order to help us sleep. This was also seen in humans, where a disruption of their microbiome with minocycline also showed reduced slow-wave sleep for up to three nights after taking it. Now, this study was actually done in 1983. I'm not sure if we could get volunteers to do this study today, have health, healthy volunteers take antibiotics for no reason. So how does the microbiome affect our circadian clock? One of the ways is through short-chain fatty acids. That's an important metabolite that we know that our microbes make. There's a circadian rhythmicity to the production of these short-chain fatty acids. And propionate, butyrate, acetate are all produced at peak levels at different times during the day. By giving oral short-chain fatty acids, as they did in this study, they were able to change the expression patterns of the peripheral clock genes. And well, they tried different prebiotic fibers, fibers such as cellobios versus cellulose, which have different um, times of degradation when they hit the microbiome, those also were able to change the peripheral clock genes. And one of the ways that butyrate can control clock gene expression is by directly changing histone acetylation of the clock genes themselves. This is another study that shows that specific microbial metabolites can be induced with different feeding conditions, such as low or high fat diets, and that these metabolites, some of them being short chain fatty acids, directly modulate the circadian clock gene expression in liver cells, so some of the peripheral clock genes. And they also then regulate host metabolism. So this was an interesting study that showed that both a low-fat and a high-fat diet can affect both central and peripheral circadian gene expression, even in germ-free mice. So the, the high and the low-fat diet changed clock gene expression even when there was no microbiome. But in these cases, the mice remained lean even when they were fed a high-fat diet. And now when they did this circadian disruption with mice, or sorry, when they fed high fat and low fat diet to mice that had a microbiome, the high fat diet resulted in obesity in the mice. So it shows that a microbiome is necessary to transfer diet induced obesity from a high fat diet. The study showed that a diet clearly changes the microbiome to a healthier, that clearly changes it to a healthier state. They included, you know, lactoferrin and some really good things in the diet, and it was able to enhance sleep quality and diurnal rhythm in rats. Another way that our diet can affect our microbiome is through polyphenols in our food. So polyphenols are components that we know can change the microbiome, and we also know that some polyphenols can be converted into different metabolites that then get absorbed and can affect us, such as this one that showed enterolactone, which is a bacterial metabolite from lignans, can change clock gene expression. Another way that our microbiome can affect humans is through the bile acids. Now, bile acids are a very active area of research, and it can get complex pretty quickly. So let's try to keep it simple. <laughs> a high-fat diet can induce 
bile acid production, right? Because we need bile acid in order to absorb our fats. And when we have a lot of bile acid in our gut, it's going to decrease bile-sensitive organisms. A lot of these beneficial organisms are sensitive to these primary bile acids. And the bile-tolerant organisms will tend to increase. So this changes bacterial composition. And then this then affects microbial rhythms of this composition and function. It's one of the ways that high-fat diets have their effect, and that also changes host lip lipid metabolism. Now, many of these bile-tolerant organisms, one of the things that they produce is hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide inhibits butyrate production, and it also inhibits host mitochondrial function and clock gene expression. So that's another way that they work. Now, on the other hand, there's an enzyme that's produced by these organisms, um, by these microbes, called bile salt hydrolase. And what it does is it deconjugates the bile acids. So the primary bile acids that are produced by our liver, BSH deconjugates them. And BSH activity actually leads to improvements in host metabolic health. It leads to reduced weight, reduced cholesterol and reduced triglycerides. And it's interesting to note that the bacteria that produce BSH are the ones like lactobacillus. They're not the ones that are bile tolerant that produce hydrogen sulfide. So BSH, this conjugation activity, seems to be protective of that metabolic phenotype. And of course, these unconjugated bile acids, it shouldn't be a surprise by now, actually work to control her circadian gene expression in the host. Now, microbes can also make many vitamins, right? They make a lot of B vitamins, and we also know that B vitamins can affect our sleep patterns. It's likely another way that microbes can affect our circadian rhythm in our sleep. And we also know that certain gut microbes are able to make melatonin. We heard a lot about melatonin already today, but melatonin is made by our microbes, and melatonin also controls our microbes, and it controls the circadian rhythms of our microbes, and it can change swarming patterns in our bacteria. To support this melatonin connection, there was a study done using VSL-3, which you know is a probiotic, and VSL-3 resulted in improvement in IBS symptoms. And these improved symptoms correlated with an increase in melatonin levels. So there's a nice connection there. So my practitioner tip actually is collaboration. So I've been hearing about uh, neurosensory feedback, um, different sort of practitioners in the community, and actually how we should be looking to work together and actually utilize each other's specialties rather than trying to do everything in one consultation on your own. So uh, working with a nutritional therapist, a registered nutritionist, uh, working with a physiotherapist and working with functional neurologists as well, I think it would be fantastic, particularly through the perspective of um, brain health and um, improving TBI, traumatic brain injuries. All right, we are here in Texas with Dr. Cheng Ron. He runs one of the coolest functional medicine clinics here in Texas, and we're gonna be talking about brain health. Doc, what was the first time you realized that brain health was gonna be a big part of your work? When I slice into a human brain, so as cool as it sounds, it is kind of cool. So uh, during medical school, I was a neural anatomy teaching assistant. Okay. And my job was to do cross sections of brain, yeah. tag it with little pins, and then create quizzes for the other medical students who are under me. Uh, so these are what we call lab practicals, right? And uh, so what I learned from that is, well, I learned how the brain feels in my hand and under a knife. What I also learned is that there's so many variations in a human brain, and the brain is one of the most intricate and misunderstood and under-understood organs that we have. And it's 2019, and even in 2019, we, have, we don't have a great understanding of what the brain truly can do. And so when, we, when you look at a brain, okay, and you see connections that are in there, and what we used to think was that these connections control the rest of the body and the way that we think, the way that we feel, in the way that um, our body is supposed to work in unison, okay? That's true to an extent, but what we also know is it's two-way communication. We know that the gut affects the brain modulation. We know that our environment, where, where we live, our toxins affect brain modulation. We know that our relationships affect that. We know that our metabolics and the way we sleep, the way, you know, whether we meditate or not, 
And all these things are, are, are part of the bigger picture of how the brain is able to be modulated. And it's not just about neurotransmitters and synapses. There's something far greater here that I think um, and conventionally, in conventional neurology, it's really missing the boat. And so, but that's really when I started really being really uh, attentive to what the brain can actually do. The other thing is my mom is an acupuncturist and uh, herbal, herbalist. And so um, when, I, when I was studying in medical school and in high school, um, I always have needles with me, acupuncture needles with me. And uh, if I feel real tense or stressed, I'll literally put needles in my head and all on my shoulders and it's, it's instantly and I'm, I'm good, right? And but the, the, also my reception of information coming in is also exponentially better with the needles in. Could it be placebo? Maybe. But could it be something else? And so the interest in all that on the integrative side yeah. is something that we're just starting to kind of figure out in 2019. Awesome. So I know you're doing like some Bredesen protocol stuff. You're doing a lot of uh, different kinds of interventions at this conference. You were talking about particularly neuromodulation through fasting. Right. So what is the mechanism by which brain, the brain gets affected by the low caloric intake? Right. So really good question. This is really found out very recently. Uh, but one of the mechanisms, there is a sequence of genes that gets turned on, okay? And it's modified by a balance of leptin and neuropeptide Y, okay? And these are the, these are the hormones uh, that uh, are upregulated or downregulated during times of low caloric intake or fasting um, or high caloric intake of fasting. And that interplay uh, of neuropeptide Y and leptin is what creates a completely different genetic expression uh, of, of different aspects of, uh, of pain modulation. That's just to put it really simply. It's actually far more complicated than that, but it's a very simple way to start looking at it. That's number one. Number two, during the fasting phase, and especially uh, studies that was done by Walter Longo on fasting mimicking study, uh, animal studies and human studies, I mean, we know that our body goes through a period of autophagy after a short fast. And autophagy just means that our, you know, it's called self-eating, auto and phagy. And so that self-eating is that we're actually getting rid and eating up uh, a lot of the damaged cells and mitochondria in our body in preparation for regeneration. And after the fast, whatever we feed our body is going to contribute towards that regeneration only if it's good food. So if you eat something like flaming hot Cheetos or something afterwards, it may not go towards that, right? And so in the, in the concept of fasting, and fasting is, is you know, most of the fasting studies are done uh, during Ramadan, okay? And during Ramadan, there is, it's a water fast and a food fast until after sundown, right? And, um, and we know that there's major neurotransmitter upregulation. Serotonin, serotonin balance uh, or, or with glutamate balance is significantly better. So it's not that the total serotonin goes up, but the glutamate can go down. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter that can promote pain as well. Serotonin is the happy neurotransmitter that can inhibit some pain pathways. We also know that fasting, for some reason, we don't know why, activates cannabinoid receptors and also active, activates pain receptors. And so there's so many intricacies to fasting because fasting is a state uh, it, where our body is able to do things that it's not generally able to do in a state of constant eating. And uh, for, for many different reasons, we now know it modulates pain. Awesome. So, you know, you've been doing this for a while in practice, being on the cutting edge. You know, obviously the, the pathways matter and the mechanism matters, but as far as getting people better, like what have you learned from doing, uh, from doing this in practice that other clinicians need to learn so they don't have to make the same mistakes? Oh, really good question. And I, I have to pick where to start because there's so many tidbits that we've learned. I think the most important thing for other clinicians to understand is that when you implement food as medicine into your practice, changes happen in days and not weeks and months or years. Um, I'll give you examples. So there are times when people come into the practice though I really think I need an antidepressant, okay? So a lot of these antidepressants takes two to six weeks to even start working. But if you change your diet, it really takes a few days to start working. You actually be able to see some major implications, especially if the, if the patient has, an anti, has a pro-inflammatory diet to begin with, yeah. okay? And so, and so the follow-up is actually much shorter. It was like, hey, how you doing? It's all much better, you know, after, yeah. after this time. 
Um, and now that, that's a rewarding thing on both parties, right? The, on the patient side and on the practitioner side. That's number one. Number two, what you realize is that you start empowering people to know their bodies. And most people say, oh, you know, if I go on this elimination diet and I, and I reintroduce some things, I feel worse when I, when I reintroduce it. Well, is it really that you feel worse or are you now in tune with your body and you know what feel, uh, feeling good truly feels like? And now you have a new baseline to compare to, yeah. right? And I think it's the latter. Yeah. And, uh, and now people are able to make these choices on their own, but be very in tune with their body. Um, and, uh, and the third thing that, um, that we have to understand is that a lot of practicing functional medicine, integrative health, is managing expectations as well, right? And so we as practitioners, especially in my group, we have seven providers in my group, uh, we service 10,000 patients so far. It's been a year and 11 months since we opened, actually. Yeah. We've served 10,000 patients. And there's a lot of expectations. Oh, you guys do integrative and functional health. Make me better tomorrow. So there's those people that want to get better tomorrow, but also know that it's a partnership. Okay, when you come into the clinic, I will give my 110% if you give your 110%. And so what we do is we assess people on a readiness scale, 0 to 10. How ready are you to make some changes? And if you're like in a five and a four, and are we really going to be talking about diet changes right now? Maybe not, maybe come up to follow. So I think those three things are the most important thing that I learned. How would you compare like dietary changes to fasting as the like intervention to get, um, to, to sort of alert people to the potential of what's about to happen? Great, great. That's a really good question. And most people ask me, what's, well, what do I do first, fasting or, or changes in food? Well, we look at it like a program, right? So um, what is the point of fasting? The point of fasting is to get into the autophagy, get into the part where your body is able to take away these damaged cells, get up your stem cell rejuvenation, and by the end of the fast, and then refeed with really good quality food, right? So in between fasts, you want to be eating good quality food as well. And so the order, I think, is very important. When people go through a fast, um, every time they go through a fast, it's a different experience. The first time may be really easy, I got this. Second time may be very emotional. Third time may be, wow, I feel terrible, okay? And it's not, it's not that the fast is doing different things to them at that time, it's that they are in a different state every time they try to go through a fast, okay? So fasting is the quickest way for you to know your body. Yeah. Um, and where dietary change is more of a long-term thing, it's a lifestyle adaptation, right? And so with dietary change, you are learning things about your body, all right? But when you learn things about your body, you also have to bring a new relationship with your body, and that's more of a long-term change. But fasting puts you into that mix and, uh, and makes you aware, wow, I'm opening the fridge 18,000 times and I'm supposed to be fasting. It's like, oh, right, I'm not supposed to be eating anything, right? And so it makes you aware of habits that you created that you were not conscious of. And that's what fasting does really, really well. I like to employ fasting first because it teaches that relationship with the body. You follow up with the patient right after the fast or a fasting mimicking diet is something that we use in the practice really, really often. And I prefer that over, over a true fast anyways. And so, and so you're, you're talking about relationship building with your body and you're also talking about long-term uh, building blocks and reinvention of what healthy truly is and creating health through both fasting and through dietary modulation. Yeah, that's so awesome. Well, um, you know, in your, in your talk, uh, I know that you, you, know, you shared, you, you were talking also on behalf of um, the fast mimicking diet. Well, how do you coordinate the efforts in your practice to sort of make this really easy to implement? Right, so the fasting mimicking diet is not an easy thing to implement <laughs> right off the bat. I think you have to really have a truly good understanding of it and, here, and, the under, and also good delivery, right? It's not like also, you know, um, for, you know, we use the, the Prolon kit for the fasting mimicking diet. It's not like we'll give you a Prolon box and just do it for five days and we'll see what happens. It doesn't work like that. And it really comes to, uh, it really comes to asking a lot of questions beforehand and during and after. And so in trying to employ the fasting and making dive, number one is the readiness skill. How ready are you to do this, right? If you're not gonna be attend, then don't do the fast. You know, you wanna come back next month, cool. Totally fine with it. 
Um, and if they're all in at that time, like what goals have you set yourself for this? You know, are you trying to get better body composition? Are you trying to feel better? Are you, what are you trying to do and set goals, right? And setting goals. So first is readiness scale. Number two is setting goals and that's short-term goals and long-term goals. So short-term goals is what happens during the fast. Long-term goals is what happens in between the fast. So we usually we have them do three in a row. Yeah. Okay. Uh, three in a row, meaning, uh, you know, they do, they do one box a month for three months in a row, not necessarily three in a row in a row. Yeah. And so, um, and so once they understand those metrics and what we're looking at, now we're setting up some expectations right there. Okay, and then it's troubleshooting. And what troubleshooting is, okay, well, during the first day of the fast, you may be fine. The second day, you may or may not be. Third day, you might get a little headache. But the, and, and also understanding that everyone responds differently to this. But always have keep people in mind why we're doing this in the first place and making them understand that this is totally worth it, <laughs> right? If it's not worth it, then, then don't do it. Hi, I'm Dr. T. Skrazian from the Skrazian Institute, and I want to give you a tip about pain, depression, and addiction. One of the key things to understand about pain, addiction, and uh, uh, chronic stress, and all the things that are associated with this vicious cycle is that ultimately, at the end of the day, this is related to impaired brain function. So when you're looking at the aspects of the brain, the brain has descending uh, serotonergic inhibition pathways, and if those are imbalanced, you get chronic pain. There's pathways in the frontal lobe that actually suppress dopaminergic uh, addiction pathways. So when we see someone who's got chronic pain, who's got chronic addiction, really what we're dealing with is not a chemical imbalance, but really an imbalance in the frontal lobe and really clinical signs of uh, frontal lobe degeneration. So uh, one of the key things you really want to do is evaluate the frontal lobe, look at executive function, look at the patient being on time, look at their planning functions, and then look at all of these different strategies to slow down and improve uh, brain function as we all know how to do in a functional medicine model. At Fullscript, we've been busy creating an industry-leading experience for practitioners so that their patients can experience industry-leading integrative healthcare. How do we do it? By constantly improving practitioner workflows through EHR integrations, we give practitioners the ability to write supplement recommendations through Fullscript without leaving their preferred EHR. By making it easy to send similar recommendations and resources to multiple patients with our templates tool. Simply create a recommendation once and customize for each patient. Through adherence management, patient adherence is a priority with directed patient prescriptions, fulfillment reminders, refill reminders, and auto ship. Keeping patients on the path to wellness has never been more attainable. And coming soon, patients will be able to receive customizable reminders via email or text. So even on the busiest of days, their supplement protocol will always be top of mind. We're helping practitioners find the products that are best suited to their patients' needs. With the click of a button, our new search tool helps you find supplements that accommodate allergies, lifestyle choices, and patient preferences. And by using advanced technologies coupled with a mountain of user research and feedback, we're rolling out a brand new, unparalleled, immersive patient experience. At Fullscript, we're taking the hassle out of integrative healthcare, one innovation at a time. Join us at fullscript.com slash sign up. So you know that we like to throw a little bit of practice management into our functional forums. And there was a great talk at PLMI given by Jeremy Kubicek. Now, one of the things he talked about is how much stress do you put on your patients by communicating to them in a way that they're not used to or that they can't really interact with. We had such a great talk from Jeremy. We thought we'd just put a little bit in and just to get you thinking about how you communicate with your patients. Check it out. What I'm gonna to bring to you today is I'm gonna give you another level of um, thinking on areas that maybe you haven't thought about. In fact, maybe I'll do with you what you've done with me, where you've caused me to maybe go, uh, I've never thought like this before. I hope to maybe do the same as it comes to human dynamics. So let me tell you my background real quick. Um, I mentioned um, I lived in Russia. Um, I've started about 24 companies in 20 something years, okay? And so I, I've started a lot of businesses. My current business, my main business is called Giant, and we work with uh, governments and organizations in about 20 countries, uh, large companies, different places, but our whole thing is people dynamics. This is you, this is someone else, how do you relate to each other? And what we've done is we've just taken it down and we've tried to figure out, there's all of this expertise from different uh, 
psychologists and statisticians and Harvard and different institutes, which is great, really good information, but it never transfer to the next level. So we've just focused on the idea of scaling relational health. How do you actually transfer and multiply inside practices and organizations? So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna take a concept that we've called the five voices. Now you've got a book of ours that we've written, and that book, uh, if you haven't, it's outside, you can grab one afterwards. What we've tried to do is take the concept of, of uh, personality and make it so simple that it will spread throughout your entire staff, to your patients, and so forth. So I'm gonna try to attempt to tailor that to your world specifically with the idea of five voices for physicians. So here's the big idea. Every single patient wants to be heard, right? They want to be heard. Well, you also have your own style of delivering information. Some of you are really good at intuitively altering or tailoring that information to the person you're talking with. You've just gotten good at it intuitively. You just don't have a language for it. We may actually give you the language that actually makes that make more sense. Some of you actually are unaware of what it's like to be on the other side of yourself. Some of you don't realize that you're only 30% effective because only 30% of the population is listening to you effectively, but you deliver that information the same way in the same style to everyone. So the concept of the platinum rule is simply uh, you know, do unto others as they would want done to themselves. So if I do unto others as I would want to myself, I don't really need a lot of information. I'm real quick, just give it to me fast, and let's get on with it. That may not be helpful for another personality type. So we've taken Jungian typology, okay, which is where Myers-Briggs is public domain, where Myers-Briggs uh, took their information, all the different researchers and clinicians, and we've taken it, and we've created a formula that's actually so much more scalable with the whole goal of getting every patient to let them be heard. So what, if every, what could happen if you could communicate with every patient at the perfect level that they needed so that they will listen to you, take your advice, and shape it to create a plan that fits them like a glove. That's just the idea. So here's, the, um, here's some thoughts for you. We've taken the research and we've figured out, and again, this is back to Jungian typology, these are the types of first voice percentages that exist in our population. I'll make, I'll make it make sense here in a second. There are 43% of the population, for instance, or what we would call nurturers, okay? If you were in the Myers-Briggs world, they would be in the SF world. So 43% of the population happen to be nurturers. 70% of that 43% happen to be women. So this is where most of the teachers are. This is stay-at-home moms. They're nurses. A lot of your staff are going to be here. A lot of uh, certain you know, personality types, so as they're coming in, you might recognize who they are. And my hope is I will give you some clues, not how to typecast them, because that's, that's not fair, but to see clues of how they're behaving. The next category is 9%, which are creatives. The creatives have an idea of, of what to be, and I'll explain each one of them. Uh, there's no gender difference on that, but 9% of the population, 30% are guardians, 70% of that population are men, and they exist in, um, they might be accountants, they might be police officers, military, uh, real structured um, types of, of, of people, very black and white, 11% connectors and 7% pioneers. Now I say all of those percentages, I'm gonna go into them, but if you look at the top categories, 43 and 30, 73% of the population are focused on today. They're present-oriented people. Only 27% are focused on tomorrow. So when you're talking to a patient, there's a good chance they're going to be in the first, those nurture and guardian categories. They want and process information very, very differently than that 27%. And they'll respond very differently to, to you as a physician because there's different levels of influence. A pioneer, for instance, is not really interested in what you tell them, they're gonna find out research and to see if you're credible by asking other people that they trust. <laughs> it makes no difference what you tell them. They might help a little bit, but mostly it's like they're gonna ask my buddy, hey, you like this guy, is he good? Okay, I'm in. 
But then they want information and they want it fast and they want it very differently than the nurturer who might come in and really need to be felt. So I hope you enjoyed this really clinical episode of the Functional Forum. There's some great stuff in there. Next month, we are gonna to travel to the Integrative Medicine for the Underserved Conference in Santa Clara, California. We're gonna be hearing about group visits, social justice, and all different ways to be able to get this kind of medicine that we love to the underserved and to America's most vulnerable people. It's an incredible opportunity. There are still tickets available. I hope to see you there. If not, we'll be back on the Functional Forum in September. Until then, we'll see you next time.